This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and today is Monday, and that means it's time for the 526th MTG Top 10. In this series, I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition, and today, we're going to take a look at the Top 10 Multicolored Artifacts. In the past, I've looked at other multicolored card types, including Planeswalkers, Instant Sorceries, and Enchantments, so it makes sense to also look at the Artifact type. In particular, Blade Coil Serpent and Clay Champion from the Brothers War got me to wondering about artifacts with multicolored identities and how they've performed over time. To be eligible for this list, a card had to have the artifact type and it had to have a multicolored identity, with one exception. I chose not to include Mana Rocks because they would have made this list a lot less interesting. In all, there are 221 artifacts with multicolored identities, and in this video, we'll talk about the 10 that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A first tier top eight is worth two points. This includes events like Pro Tours and World Championships. And a second tier top eight is worth one point. This includes events like regional championships and Grand Prix. All right, let's take a look at Magic's top 10 multicolored artifacts. At number 10, it is Zabaz, the Glimmer Wasp. This little legendary creature enters with a plus one plus one counter and it has modular. Modular means that when a creature with it dies, you can move its plus one plus one counters to another artifact creature. Zabaz even makes modular better, since it allows you to put an additional counter on a creature if the modular mechanic is how those counters are getting placed there. He makes a list by virtue of the red and white mana symbols in the text box. If you pay one red, he can destroy one of your artifacts, and if you pay one white, he can gain flying. The first ability might sound weird, but it allows you to kill things with modular to move counters around at instant speed. Zabaz is from Modern Horizons 2, which means it's only legal in Modern, Legacy, and Vintage, and it's already done some pretty significant work in Modern, where it's played in Hardened Scales decks, alongside fellow powerful modular creature Arcbound Ravager, and a whole lot of other cards that love plus one plus one counters. I expect Zabaz will be gaining more points in Modern in the future. At number 9, it is Behemoth Sledge. The Sledge comes from Alara Block the first block to ever feature colored or multicolored artifacts, and it's really still the set that featured multicolored artifacts the most prominently. Before Alara block, the only colored artifacts there were were cards like Trans Guild Courier that just simply said it was all colors. Unsurprisingly, this list features many cards from Alara block. Anyway, the sledge gives plus two, plus two, lifelink, and trample, the kind of boost that makes a creature into a huge problem, and because this is equipment, you can move it around and decide what creature you want to enhance. Not only does it make the creature much larger, but because of trample, it also can't be chump block, and life link means it's going to gain its controller a bunch of life, allowing them to win just about any race. By today's standards, this equipment does look fairly clunky, but in standard between 2009 and 2010, it was played in some aggro decks that featured Stoneforge Mystic, as it gave you a nice piece of equipment to tutor up in ideal situations, like against aggro decks. It hasn't gained any points, though, since 2009. At number 8, it is Oni Cult Anvil, which is the newest card to make the list. The Anvil gives you a 1-1 artifact creature token, the first time an artifact you control leaves the battlefield during your turn, and it also comes with the ability to sacrifice artifacts and drain the opponent one life. To an extent, the card can fuel itself, as once you get your first 1-1 token, you can just sacrifice it every turn and get a new one while draining your opponent. It also works quite well with blood and treasure tokens, which are plentiful and standard right now, making standard a format it is continuing to see significant play in. It has already also seen play in Pioneer, including index named for the Anvil, as well as more general Sacrifice decks. It even already has a single point in Modern. The Anvil is still in Standard right now, and has already broken into two other formats, so I suspect we will continue to see it move up this list in the future. At number 7, it is Architects of Will, another multicolored artifact from Alara. The Architects are a 4-mana 3-3 that lets you reorder the top 3 cards of any player's library when it enters the battlefield. That is not an especially good card, but the Architects also come with Cycling, which can be paid for with either blue or black mana in this case. That gives the card some significant additional upside, as you can simply throw it away for something else when you don't want it. And doing so for 1 mana is pretty great. 
It has gained points in Standard, Modern, and Popper, and in all three, it sees or has seen play as a result of its ability to put itself in the graveyard and draw you another card. In Standard, it was played in the Filigree Angel deck, and in Popper, it's played in Songs of the Dam decks, which run a ton of cycling creatures to find songs, and by cycling creatures away in the first place, you make sure your Songs of the Damned produce a bunch of mana. It has done the most work, though, in Modern Living End decks. This is another deck all about cycling creatures away to find combo pieces, with the goal being to find a card with Cascade that will automatically find your Living End and let you cast it for free, reanimating all the creatures you cycled, including the Architects, and also destroying all of your opponent's creatures. It continues to see play in both Popper and Modern, which bodes well for its future. At number 6, it is Tide Hollow Sculler. The artifact zombie comes with solid stats and lets you exile the best card from your opponent's hand. Your opponent gets that card back if the Sculler ever dies, but the Sculler has usually already done enough to disrupt your opponent's game plan at that point. It was a nice disruptive creature for aggro decks in black-white, in standard and extended, and it's also featured in a variety of decks in modern. It has found the most success there in toolbox decks that use Collected Company and Court of Calling, as it can be a powerful card to search up when you really need to disrupt your opponent. It hasn't gained any points since 2021, and it is likely to move down the list in the future. At number 5, it is Thopter Foundry, another multicolored Alara artifact. The Foundry lets you pay 1 and sacrifice a non-token artifact to create a 1-1 Thopter with flying, and you gain 1 life. All of the Foundry's success has come as a result of powerful combos. The most famous of these involves Sword of the Meek, which you can sacrifice to the Foundry to make a 1-1, at which point the sword returns to the battlefield attached to that 1-1. This allows you to use that ability every single turn for every individual mana you have, creating quite the Thopter army. The Thopter combo first found success in Extended and Legacy, and got banned in the former. In 2011, when the modern format was created, this combo was enough of a concern that Sword of the Meek was preemptively banned, and that remained the case until 2016, when it got unbanned in modern. The combo made a return then, but it didn't actually find that much success until 2019, when Modern Horizons gave us both Urza, Lord High Artificer, and Goblin Engineer. The Engineer can make assembling the combo easier by putting the sword in the graveyard, and Urza's ability made it so that the combo could just go infinite right away, instead of just making as many 1-1s as you had mana for every turn, since every Thopter can now tap for mana. If that weren't enough, you could also end up with infinite mana and play your entire deck with Urza's ability too. Obviously enough, your opponent won't be coming back from that. Thopter Foundry is going to continue to gain points in Modern going forward. At number 4, it is Sphinx of the Steel Wind. This massive 6-6 Flying Sphinx also comes with First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink, and Protection from Red and Green, making it a pretty massive problem any time it enters the battlefield. It can really stabilize any board in your favor, as it's hard to block, hard to attack through, hard to kill, and hard to race because it gains you so much life. The one downside is, of course, the 8 mana required to cast it, but it's gained all of its points in decks that look to get around that downside. It didn't see any play in Standard, because there was no good way to get around the downside, but in the non-rotating formats there are plenty of ways to cheat the Sphinx into play very early, something that is very hard for most opponents to recover from. In Modern, this involved reanimating it with Unburial Rite, in Legacy, it's also put into play with reanimation spells, but also Show and Tell and Tinker, and in Vintage, it can also be brought into play with Oath of Druids. It's done the most work by far in Vintage, and that is likely to continue. At number 3, it is Golos, Tireless Pilgrim. This artifact has an identity that is all five colors. When Golos enters the battlefield, you get to search up any land and put it into play tapped. Importantly, this includes non-basic lands. He also comes with a powerful 5-color ability that lets you exile the top 3 cards of your library and you can play them all without paying their costs. So, Golos packs a ton of power, both as an enabler and a potential win condition. This has led to it finding success in all formats. In Standard, Pioneer, Historic, and Modern, it was particularly nasty in ramp decks that made use of Field of the Dead, a powerful land that cranks out a 2-2 zombie token every time you play a land while controlling 7 or more lands with different names. The field really enables a ramp deck to just keep doing its thing while building an army. Field of the Dead was an incredible creature-making engine that already wanted you to play a bunch of different lands, and Golos was great at searching up the field and any other important lands you might need. This led to the field eventually
actually getting banned in all three of those formats. However, this hasn't completely derailed Golos, who continues to see play in ramp decks like Amulet Titan and Tron in Modern, 12 Post in Legacy, and Mud decks in Vintage. These are all decks that are really interested in really powerful lands. It also works quite well in Dark Depths combo decks, which seek to combine the depths with Vesuva or Thespian Stage to put a 2020 Merit Lage into play, and Golos can search up all those combo pieces. Golos is going to keep gaining points in Modern, Legacy, and Vintage. At number 2, it is Shardless Agent. This 3-mana 2-2 comes with Cascade, which means that when you cast it, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card with a lower mana value. When you do reveal that card, you can cast it without paying its mana cost. In other words, the Agent gives you a 2-for-1 and generally an amazing deal for your mana. Shardless Agent was originally printed in Plane Chase 2012, which meant that it was only legal in Legacy and Vintage. It made the most of its Legacy legality, showing up in Sultai mid-range decks that were sometimes partially named for it. These Shardless Bug decks were a big part of Legacy between 2012 and 2017. More recently, it was a key card for the short-lived Valky Cascade deck. The way Cascade originally worked, it was possible for Shardless Agent to Cascade into Valky and then cast the Planeswalker side for free, which was near impossible to beat in the early game. Decks with this game plan didn't run any other cards with a mana value below 2, so the Agent and other Cascaders always got you Tybalt. This led to a rules change for Cascade, which can no longer cast the Planeswalker side of Valky. This meant the end of the deck, but there has been more good news than bad news for Shardless Agent in the recent past. Most notably, it received a reprint in Modern Horizons 2, giving the agent legality in Modern for the first time. Since then, it's been played in Modern decks that seek to abuse Cascade in particular, in decks using Crashing Footfalls and Living End. Both of these suspend cards have a mana value of zero, so when you cast Shardless Agent and hit one of them, you can cast it. Shardless Agent is likely to keep gaining points in Modern and Legacy going forward, and it has a real chance at eventually catching the number one card on the list, which is... Baleful Strix, which happens to be one of my favorite cards in the entire game, in large part because of that amazing art. In fact, I own a framed print of the art. Anyway, like Shardless Agent, it was originally printed in Plane Chase 2012. Unlike the Agent, even today it's only legal in Legacy and Vintage, but despite those limitations, it still comes in at number one. The Strix has flying, death touch, and a cantrip effect, and that is amazing. It's always going to give you a two for one. It's heavily played in Legacy, showing up in a wide variety of decks, including Shardless Bug, Aluren, a variety of control decks, Death Shadow, and Doomsday. It has found more limited success in Vintage, but it has gained points there as recently as earlier this year. It will be interesting to see if, in the long run, Baleful Strix will be able to hold on to its number one spot on the list. If Shardless Agent continues to be a core card in both Modern and Legacy, it may not be able to hold it off. So those are the 10 multicolored artifacts that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. If you're looking to get some of these powerful and colorful artifacts, check out the description, where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each of them. If you want to catch up on the over 520 other episodes of MTG Top 10, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. If you want to catch future MTG Top 10s, you should subscribe and turn on notifications. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can do that by becoming a patron, a channel member, or by buying Nitsahone merch, and you can find ways to do all of those things in the description. Thanks for watching.